27 hours after Charles Lindbergh took off in the spirit of St. Louis from New York's Curtis Field, he spotted several fishing boats. When a fisherman appeared at a portal of the first boat, Lindbergh circled low, closed down the throttle, leaned out the window, and shouted, Which way is Ireland? If today's extensive radar and communication network had been in operation during the golden age of aviation, Lindbergh would have had a much better chance of pinpointing his position. For example, ATC facilities monitoring the spirit of St. Louis on their radar screens could have instantly replied to a radio inquiry. Which way is Ireland would sound out of place transmitted over an aircraft radio today because specific radio procedures and terminology make communication with ATC as effective as possible. Nearly any service you obtain during flight requires radio contact, so you need to learn this unique way of communicating. In this lesson, you'll learn the procedures and protocols for communicating on your radio by exploring the following topics. VHF communication equipment. Using the radio. Communicating letters and numbers. Communicating time. Common traffic advisory frequency. Communicating at controlled airports. Lost communication procedures. And emergency communication procedures. Communication radios in general aviation aircraft use a portion of the very high frequency, or VHF, range, which includes the frequencies between 118 MHz and 135.975 MHz. Communication radios are classified according to the number of channels they have. A 360-channel radio uses 50 kHz spacing between channels, while a 720-channel radio doubles the frequencies available by using 25 kHz spacing. To receive full ATC services, you need a 720-channel transceiver, particularly in busy terminal areas. If you have only 360-channel capability, you can still operate in most areas, but expect delays and be aware that some services might not be available. Occasionally, you might encounter transceivers with only 90, 100, or 180 channels, so you should verify that your radio's frequency capability is adequate for the type of facilities you plan to contact. Because communication radios usually combine a transmitter and receiver, they are called transceivers. You can adjust the volume with the on-off volume control. To adjust the volume, pull the control knob and turn the squelch control until you hear background noise. Then, adjust the volume and turn the squelch down to remove the background noise. The squelch control determines how strong a signal has to be for you to hear the audio. Turning the squelch up increases the reception range and enables you to receive weaker signals. Use the frequency selector to change frequencies and then check the display to verify that you've set the correct frequency in the transceiver. On this transceiver, pulling the frequency selector knob enables you to select 0 0.025 MHz increments for communication frequencies. Use the frequency toggle button to switch between the active and standby frequencies. This function enables you to set your next frequency well in advance during periods of low workload. In addition, after switching to the new frequency, you retain the last frequency you used until you're sure it will no longer be needed.
The range of VHF transmissions is limited to line of sight, meaning that obstructions such as buildings, terrain, or the curvature of the Earth block the radio waves. Aircraft flying at higher altitudes are able to transmit and receive at greater distances. For example, an aircraft at 1,000 feet AGL over flat terrain can receive transmissions from 39 nautical miles. At 3,000 feet AGL, an aircraft can receive transmissions at a distance of 69 nautical miles. An aircraft at 20,000 feet AGL can transmit and receive from as far away as 174 nautical miles. VHF antennas usually are bent whip rods or plastic encapsulated blade types mounted on the top or bottom of the cabin. Normally, each transceiver in the airplane has a VHF antenna. An airplane equipped with two transceivers usually has a microphone selector switch for the respective radios, so a second microphone isn't required. When using the radio, keep your transmissions as brief as possible to help avoid frequency congestion. Before you key the mic, think about what you'll say and listen for a few moments to make sure that someone isn't already talking or waiting for a response. On your initial call, state who you're calling. Goodyear Tower. Who you are. Diamond 1 Juliet Echo Papa. Where you are. 10 miles south at 3,000 feet. And what type of service you want Request landing. In that order. If you have listened to ATIS, you can optionally indicate the letter of the ATIS information you have. Any other information might be excessive, especially in busy terminal areas. Centennial Tower, Diamond 505 Juliet Alpha, 15 miles east, request landing with information Zulu. Colorado Springs Tower, Cessna 1234 Charlie, 20 miles south. Request landing with information Mike. Pueblo Tower, Cirrus 456 Alpha Charlie, 20 miles east. Request landing with information November. When you're talking on the radio, position the mic close to your lips. Then key it and speak in a normal conversational tone. It might take a few moments for the facility you've called to respond. If you don't receive a response, try again. If no sound comes from your headset, verify that your radio is working properly. Make sure the mic isn't stuck in the transmitting position, because this can block other transmissions and disrupt communications. When identifying yourself in your radio transmission, give your aircraft type, model, or manufacturer, followed by your aircraft registration number. This information is your aircraft call sign, and you will use it in all your communication with ATC. 
Every aircraft has a registration number, also known as a tail number, painted on the outside of the aircraft. Registration numbers are usually a combination of letters and numbers. The first letter of your tail number indicates the country prefix, which is based on International Telecommunication Union, or ITU, standards. When communicating with ATC, you typically leave this letter out of the call sign in your registered country. For example, in the United States, aircraft with an N registration don't use the N prefix in their call sign. However, when flying a U.S. registered aircraft into Mexico, you would use the N. When you're using the radio, it's important to speak in a professional manner to ensure that others understand the message you're trying to convey. Slang, CB jargon, and incorrect radio procedures can compromise your safety and the safety of others. To help avoid misunderstandings, aviation has adopted standard phraseology, terminology, and pronunciation guidelines for radio communications. These standards help to differentiate between similar-sounding words, letters, and numbers improve comprehension under poor transmission conditions, and make communication more generic, lessening the effect of accents and differing pronunciations. Because letters such as B, P, D, and T have similar sounds, they can easily be mistaken for one another, especially during radio transmissions. To help avoid misunderstandings, the International Civil Aviation Organization, or ICAO, adopted a phonetic alphabet to use in radio communication. Use this alphabet when identifying your tail number during contact with ATC or other facilities, and when communicating any information containing letters such as airports, nav aids, and ATIS information letters. Click each letter to hear it spoken, and pay close attention to the pronunciation. Alpha Bravo Charlie Delta, Echo, Foxtrot, Gulf, Hotel, India, Juliet, Kilo, Lima, Mike, November, Oscar, Papa, Quebec, Romeo, Sierra, Tango, 
Uniform. Victor. Whiskey. X-ray. Yankee. Zulu. When you transmit or receive numbers over the radio, pronounce each number as you usually pronounce it, except for the number nine. Say niner to avoid confusion with the German word nein, which means no. Note that although the aim specifies the pronunciation of the number three as tree and the number five as fife, in actual practice, ATC might pronounce three as three and five as five. To reduce confusion when speaking certain sets of numbers, you usually pronounce each digit individually. For round numbers in the hundreds or thousands, for example altitudes, ceiling heights, and upper wind levels, speak the individual digits followed by the word hundred or thousand as appropriate. For example, don't say 4,500, say 4,500. However, for altitudes at and above 18,000 feet MSL, don't use the word thousand. Instead, preface the altitude with the words flight level, followed by the separate digits, but excluding the last two numbers. For example, say flight level 210 to communicate 21,000 feet. Click each number in the table to hear the correct pronunciation. Zero. One. Two. Three. Four. Five, six, seven, eight, niner, one zero, three five, five hundred, four thousand five hundred, one three thousand. Whether you use decimal points depends on the type of numeric information you're transmitting. For example, although both altimeter and radio frequencies typically have decimal points, you only need to indicate the decimal point in your transmissions of radio frequencies. To do so, use the word point to signify the decimal point. Click each example to hear the correct pronunciation. One two two point one Altimeter two niner niner two Altimeter two eight seven five one two one point niner five To clarify the type of number you're transmitting, you should use one of the prefixes or suffixes in this table. Click each example to hear the correct pronunciation. Squawk 4536. Runway 17 left. Heading 340. Altimeter 2875. Wind 220. Flight level one nine zero. One two zero knots.
121.9er, 121.9, 121.9er. Because a flight might cross several time zones, it would be confusing to estimate the arrival time at your destination using only the local time at the departure airport. To overcome this problem, aviation uses the 24-hour clock system, along with an international standard called Coordinated Universal Time, or UTC. The 24-hour clock eliminates the need for AM and PM designations because it numbers the 24 hours of the day consecutively. To convert from a 12-hour clock to a 24-hour clock, use the same number in the morning. For numbers smaller than 10, use a prefacing zero. For example, 9 a.m. becomes 0900. For numbers in the afternoon, add 12 to the number. For example, 9 p.m. becomes 2100. After you change the hours to the 24-hour clock, add the minutes. For example, 9.15 p.m. becomes 2115. Use the clock to practice converting from the 12-hour clock to the 24-hour clock. Click the arrows to change the hours on the analog clock and see the corresponding 24-hour designation on the digital clock. Coordinated Universal Time, which is referred to as Zulu Time in aviation, places the entire world on one time standard. Zulu Time is the time at the zero-degree line of longitude, which passes through Greenwich, England. All 24 world time zones are based on this reference. All ATC facilities operate on Zulu Time, regardless of where they're located. When you refer to a specific time, first convert it to the 24-hour clock and then to Zulu. To convert from local time to Zulu time in the United States, you add hours. To convert to local time from Zulu time, subtract hours, as shown in the figure and conversion table. Move your pointer over the major city shown on the map to see local, 24-hour, and Zulu times. When communicating Zulu time on the radio, give hours and minutes as four separate numbers, pronouncing the digits individually. For example, 0835. Hours without any minutes must still be followed by 00. One-digit hours or minutes must still have a leading zero. For example, 0100.
To increase safety at airports without operating control towers, it's important that all radio-equipped aircraft transmit and receive traffic information on a common frequency. You can broadcast your position and intentions to other aircraft in the area on the Common Traffic Advisory Frequency, or CTAF. At many airports, you can also use the designated CTAF to receive airport advisories, which are usually from the local fixed base operator, and activate pilot-controlled lighting if it's available. You can find Common Traffic Advisory Frequencies in the Airport Facility Directory, on aeronautical charts, or from the nearest flight service station, or FSS. There are three methods of broadcasting your intentions, as well as receiving airport and traffic information at uncontrolled airports, or at airports where the tower is not open at the time. Communicating with the Unicom operator. Contacting an FSS on the field. Or by making a self-announced broadcast. The frequency that you use depends on the facilities that are available at the airport. Click each situation to learn more. An Aeronautical Advisory Station, or UNICOM, is a privately owned communication station that transmits on a limited number of frequencies. Announcing your position and intentions is standard procedure at airports where the designated CTAF is a UNICOM. In addition, you can request an airport advisory from the UNICOM operator. These advisories usually include information such as wind direction and speed, favored runway, and known traffic. Because Unicoms are privately operated, you also can request other information or services, such as refueling. Some airports are equipped with an automated Unicom system that provides you with weather, airport advisories, and radio checks. Upon initial contact, you receive a general greeting for the airport and instructions on how to access additional information. The Airport Facility Directory contains information on Unicom availability. Some uncontrolled airports provide airport advisory services within 10 statute miles of the airport. These services might include wind direction and velocity, favored or designated runway, altimeter setting, known traffic, NOTAMs, airport taxi routes, airport traffic pattern information, and instrument approach procedures. There are two types of airport advisory services. Local Airport Advisory Service, or LAA, is provided at selected uncontrolled airports that have an FSS on the field. Remote Airport Advisory, or RAA, service is provided at specified high-activity general aviation airports where a control tower is not operating. When flying within an airport advisory area, establish two-way communication before transmitting outbound or inbound intentions or requesting an advisory. Advise the FSS of your aircraft type and full identification number. State your intentions and request an airport advisory. If your flight takes you to an airport that doesn't have a tower, an FSS, or a Unicom, the CTAF is on Multicom frequency 122.9 MHz. The purpose of Multicom is to provide an air-to-air -air communication frequency for pilots to self-announce their position and intentions. You'll also use the self-announce procedure if an airport has a tower that is temporarily closed or operated on a part-time basis, and there's no FSS on the airport or the FSS is closed. In these situations, you broadcast your proposed flight activity or ground operations on the designated CTAF to alert other traffic in the area of your intentions.
Although they might vary with the type of airport and facility, you should be familiar with the recommended CTAF procedures when arriving at or departing from an uncontrolled airport. When arriving at an uncontrolled airport, make your initial call when you are 10 miles from the airport. Front range Unicom, Diamond 50826, 10 miles south, descending through 7500, landing front range, request wind and runway information, front range. You should also report when you enter the downwind, base, and final legs of the traffic pattern. Front range traffic, Diamond 50826, entering downwind for runway 26, full stop, front range. And when you exit the runway. If you broadcast your position at specified locations, it's much easier for other pilots to establish and maintain visual contact with your aircraft. During departure, you should monitor and communicate on the CTAF. From the time you start the engine, during taxi. Front range Unicom, Diamond 50826, Corporate Air, taxiing to runway 26, request wind and traffic information, front range. And until 10 miles from the airport, unless the FARs or local procedures require otherwise. Front range traffic, Diamond 50826, departing runway 26, departing the pattern to the south, front range. In addition, if you're performing other operations at altitudes used by arriving or departing aircraft, such as practicing maneuvers, or if you're en route over the area, you should monitor the CTAF or communicate your intentions within 20 miles of the airport. Because other uncontrolled airports might be within the reception range using the same frequency, it's helpful to repeat the name of the airport at the end of your transmission. Front range Unicom, Diamond 50826, 10 miles south, descending through 7500, landing front range, request wind and runway information, front range. Front range traffic, Diamond 50826, entering downwind for runway 26, full stop, front range. Front range Unicom, Diamond 50826, Corporate Air, taxiing to runway 26, request wind and traffic information, front range. Front range traffic, Diamond 50826, departing runway 26, departing the pattern to the south, front range. Air traffic control clearances authorize you to proceed under specified traffic conditions within controlled airspace. And they are intended to prevent collisions between known aircraft and between aircraft and obstructions. You normally won't need to write down a simple clearance that you will execute immediately, such as clearance to take off. But it is a good idea to write down your clearance when there will be a significant delay before you comply, or when the clearance contains multiple instructions. To be sure that you have understood correctly, you should read back your clearance to the controller. In many cases, ATC expects you to read back the key parts of your clearance, 
for example, altitude, heading, route changes, or airspeed assignments, and takeoff or landing clearances. You must also read back runway assignments and hold short instructions contained in a taxi clearance. When responding to ATC instructions, begin each transmission with who you're calling and then identify yourself. Use these words and phrases to communicate your message. Click each term to hear it spoken in context. Centennial Tower, Cessna A7109er, Roger. Midway Tower, Cherokee 3639er Whiskey, 10 miles west for landing, have numbers. Aurora Tower, Cessna 8367 November, ready for takeoff, remaining in the pattern for touch and goes. DuPage Tower, Lance 8799er Echo, say again. Colorado Springs Tower, Cessna 135 Juliet Romeo, speak slower. Centennial Tower, Cessna 8435 Romeo, student pilot. DuPage Tower, Cessna 1234 Bravo, unable to climb at 1,000 feet per minute. Midway Tower, Cherokee 3639er Whiskey, 10 miles south, landing with golf. When providing clearances, ATC uses standard terminology, so it's easier to interpret and comply with their instructions. This table explains common ATC instructions given to VFR pilots. Other instructions are covered in the Pilot Controller Glossary, or PCG, an FAA publication. Click each term to hear it spoken in context. Cessna 501 Juliet Charlie, Midway Tower, acknowledge receipt of hold short clearance. Cessna 76 Romeo Sierra, Gary Tower, runway 20 closed due to disabled aircraft. Say intentions? Cessna 20 Juliet Alpha Centennial Tower, clear to land runway 17 left. Bonanza 2030 Hotel, Centennial Tower, cleared for takeoff. After departure, contact Denver Departure Control on 125.9er for radar advisories. Cherokee 8236 November, Denver Approach, cleared to enter Class Bravo Airspace, fly heading 060, maintain 7000. Cessna 20 Juliet Alpha, Centennial Ground, monitor tower on 120.5. Cessna 978 Echo, DuPage Tower, report airport in sight, over. Lance 87909 Echo, South Bend Tower, descend at pilot's discretion to pattern altitude. Cirrus 349er Charlie Delta, Centennial Tower, taxi into position and hold, runway 17 left. Cherokee 3639er Whiskey, Centennial Tower, read back hold short clearance. Mooney 7188 Uniform, Dubuque Tower, cleared for takeoff. After departure, turn left, heading 080 for radar advisories. Report leaving 2000. Departure control frequency will be 124.25. Cessna 66 Charlie, Midway Tower, stand by for clearance. Your communication with ATC varies based on the size of the airport and the services that it provides. You can expect more complex procedures at larger airports due to heavier traffic and more ATC services. Follow these steps when departing from an airport. If the airport doesn't offer a service, skip to the next step. In each case, when contacting a new Controller, provide your aircraft type and tail number, and state your request. Listen to the ATIS recording, which includes current airport information, such as the altimeter setting and active runway. McClellan Palomar Airport, Information Foxtrot, 1656 Zulu, wind 280 at 8, visibility 1015000 scattered, temperature 33, 2.3, altimeter 2981, runway 24 in use. Clearance delivery frequency is 134.85. VFR aircraft, state location and destination. Notice to airmen, 90-foot crane located south of runway 24. Advise on initial contact, you have information Foxtrot. Contact clearance delivery for departure clearance if the ATIS message instructs you to. Busy terminal areas typically have clearance delivery facilities to relay IFR clearances to departing IFR traffic and improve traffic coordination. 
Note that clearance delivery provides only detailed departure instructions. It doesn't authorize aircraft movement. After clearance delivery issues the clearance and you've read it back, the controller will instruct you to contact ground control. Palomar Clearance Delivery, Piper 8252 Sierra, Information Foxtrot, VFR to the southeast. Piper 8252 Sierra, Palomar Clearance Delivery. After departure, fly heading 250, climb and maintain 2,500 feet. Squawk 3504, SoCal departure frequency will be 127.3. Contact Ground Control 121.8 when ready to taxi. Contact Ground Control for clearance to taxi to the active runway. At unfamiliar airports, you can request a progressive taxi, which means that a controller will give you precise taxi instructions or direct you along the taxi route in stages. Ground control is an ATC function for directing the movement of aircraft and other vehicles on the airport surface. At busy airports, ground control might instruct you to wait in a holding area near the runway. Palomar Ground, Piper 8252 Sierra, at the General Aviation Ramp, ready to taxi for departure. Have information, Foxtrot. Piper 52 Sierra, Palomar Ground, taxi to runway 24. Contact the control tower for a takeoff clearance. When you receive the clearance, Make a final check for traffic before you taxi onto the runway. Palomar Tower, Piper 8252 Sierra, ready for takeoff, runway 24. Piper 8252 Sierra, Palomar Tower, cleared for takeoff, runway 24. After takeoff, contact departure control. Unless you've requested flight advisories, the radar controller will terminate radio contact when you clear the coverage area. If the airport has no departure control, you may terminate radio contact when you're five miles from the airport. Departure control, Piper 8252 Sierra, climbing through 1,600 for 2,500. Piper 8252 Sierra, SoCal departure, radar contact report reaching 2,500. McClellan Palomar Airport, information Foxtrot, 1656 Zulu. Wind 280 at 8, visibility 1015,000 scattered, temperature 33, 2.3, altimeter 2981, runway 24 in use. Clearance delivery frequency is 134.85. VFR aircraft, state location and destination. Notice to airmen, 90-foot crane located south of runway 24. Advise on initial contact, you have information, Foxtrot. Palomar Clearance Delivery, Piper 8252 Sierra, Information Foxtrot, VFR to the southeast. Piper 8252 Sierra, Palomar Clearance Delivery. After departure, fly heading 250, climb and maintain 2,500 feet. Squawk 3504, SoCal departure frequency will be 127.3. Contact Ground Control 121.8 when ready to taxi. Palomar Ground, Piper 8252 Sierra, at the General Aviation Ramp, ready to taxi for departure. Have information, Foxtrot. Piper 52 Sierra, Palomar Ground, taxi to runway 24. Palomar Tower, Piper 8252 Sierra, ready for takeoff, runway 24. Piper 8252 Sierra, Palomar Tower, cleared for takeoff, runway 24. Departure Control, Piper 8252 Sierra. Climbing through 1,600 for 2,500. Piper 8252 Sierra, SoCal departure. Radar contact report reaching 2,500. When you arrive at an airport, your communication contacts are in the reverse order of your departure contacts. When you're 15 miles out from the airport, listen to ASOS or AWOS or ATIS if available. You might also want to monitor the tower or approach control and listen to what's going on. McClellan Palomar Airport, Information Hotel, 1855 Zulu, wind 260 at 12, visibility 15, 12,000 scattered, temperature 30, 2.15, altimeter 2984, runway 24 in use, clearance delivery frequency is 134.85, VFR aircraft, state location and destination, Notice to airman, 90-foot crane located south of runway 24. Advise any initial contact, you have information hotel. No less than 10 miles out from the airport, contact approach control if available and provide your present position, your altitude, and the ATIS information you have. 
If ADIS is unavailable, but AWOS or ASOS are, advise Approach Control you have the numbers. Approach Control provides separation and sequencing of inbound aircraft and traffic advisories or safety alerts when necessary. Approach Control frequencies are published on sectional charts and broadcast over ADIS. At large terminals, expect different frequencies for approach control, depending on your arrival sector. SoCal Approach, Piper 8252 Sierra, over Black Mountain, with hotel at 4,500, landing Palomar. Piper 8252 Sierra, SoCal, Squawk 3550 and ident. Piper 52 Sierra, SoCal, radar contact 15 miles east of Palomar Airport, fly heading 230 for runway 24 at Palomar. Contact the control tower for clearance to land when approach control instructs you to. After landing, taxi clear of the runway and remain on the tower frequency until the controller tells you to contact ground. Palomar Tower, Piper 8252 Sierra, landing. Piper 52 Sierra, Palomar Tower, cleared to land runway 24. Piper 52 Sierra, turn left on the next available taxiway and contact ground 121.8. Finally, when the tower instructs you to, contact ground control for taxi clearance to the parking area. Palomar Ground, Piper 8252 Sierra, off runway 24, taxi to transient parking. Piper 52 Sierra, continue straight ahead to transient parking on your right. McClellan Palomar Airport, Information Hotel, 1855 Zulu, wind 260 at 12, visibility 15, 1 2000 scattered. Temperature 30, dew point 15, altimeter 29084. Runway 24 in use. Clearance delivery frequency is 134.85. VFR aircraft, state location and destination. Notice to airman, 90 foot crane located south of runway 24. Advise any initial contact, you have information hotel.
You must establish two-way radio communication with the control tower before you enter Class D airspace. If your communication radios become inoperative, it's still possible to land at an airport with an operating control tower by following lost communication procedures. If you're unable to contact ATC, verify that you're using the correct frequency. If you are, but you still can't contact ATC, try a different frequency if one is available. Check the volume and squelch on your transceiver. Check the switch position on your audio control panel. Verify that your mic is properly plugged into the jack. If you're wearing a headset, ensure that both the speaker and the mic plugs are inserted all the way into the jacks. Try the handheld mic if you're using a headset. If your aircraft is equipped with more than one radio, try the alternate transceiver. If it's within range, request assistance from the last facility you had contact with. If, after taking these steps, you're still unable to contact ATC, follow lost communication procedures. If you believe that your radio has failed, set your transponder to code 7600. If you're in an area of radar coverage, code 7600 will alert ATC of your radio failure. Remain outside of Class D airspace until you determine the direction and flow of traffic. If your transmitter works, advise the tower of your aircraft type, position, and altitude, and your intention to land, and then request to be controlled by light signals. When you are approximately 3 to 5 miles from the airport, advise the tower of your position and join the airport traffic pattern, remembering to self-announce your position on downwind or when turning to base in case your transmitter is working. If your receiver is working, monitor the airport frequency for landing or traffic information. Maintain visual contact with the tower to receive light signals. To acknowledge tower transmissions or light signals, rock your wings in daylight or blink your landing light or navigation lights at night. In the event of radio failure, a tower controller can provide light signals to your aircraft. A specific meaning of each color or color combination depends on whether the aircraft is in flight or on the ground. For example, after a communication failure, a steady green light signal from the control tower to an aircraft in flight indicates that you're cleared to land. Click each light signal to see an example.
An emergency can be either a distress or an urgency condition. The Aeronautical Information Manual defines distress as a condition of being threatened by serious or imminent danger that requires immediate assistance, such as fire, mechanical failure, or structural failure. You're experiencing an urgency situation the moment you become doubtful about your position, fuel endurance, weather, or any other condition that could adversely affect flight safety. If you become apprehensive about your safety for any reason, you should request assistance. Don't wait until the situation develops into a distress condition. and words for exclusive use in The FAA has designated specific frequencies, transponder codes, and words for exclusive use in emergencies. In an emergency, set your radio to 121.5 MHz. This frequency is used across the United States for transmitting emergency messages and is monitored by military towers, most civil towers, flight service stations, and radio facilities. Indicate the type of condition you're in, using the word Mayday for a distress condition and Pan Pan for an urgency condition. Mayday commands radio silence on the frequency in use, while Pan Pan gives you priority over all other communication, warning other stations not to interfere with your transmissions. The table shows an example emergency message. In addition to these radio broadcasts, change your transponder code to 7700. This code triggers an alarm or special indication at all radar facility control positions. Although you might not know whether your aircraft is within radar coverage, it's a good idea to squawk 7700 to alert any ATC facility that might be in the area. If you're under radar control and in contact with ATC, continue squawking the assigned code unless instructed otherwise. Pan Pan! Pan Pan! Pan Pan, Denver Radio, 5674 Romeo, Cessna 172, trapped above overcast, marginal VFR, request radar vectors to nearest VFR airport, Newburgh VOR, heading 253 degrees, 6500, estimate 30 minutes fuel remaining, three people aboard, squawking 7700. The assistance that ATC can provide to you during an emergency depends on how quickly you report the problem and on the amount of information you provide. Controllers will offer as much assistance as possible when you're in an emergency situation, including providing advice and information on airport availability, associated approach aids, weather information, and terrain clearance. Providing radar assistance and navigation services if you're within radar coverage. Clearing traffic so that you have priority for landing. Dispatching intercept and escort services. Keep in mind that in many cases, controllers won't know whether flight into instrument conditions will result from their instructions. To avoid possible hazards resulting from being vectored into IFR conditions, keep the controller advised of the current weather conditions and the weather along the course ahead. If you're unable to land at an airport, search and rescue workers can locate your downed aircraft by listening for its Emergency Locator Transmitter, or ELT. ELTs are designed to activate automatically in the event of an accident and transmit a distinctive audio tone on 121.5 MHz, 243.0 MHz, and 406.0 MHz. In addition, most aircraft are designed to enable you to manually activate the ELT. Required for most general aviation airplanes, 
These electronic battery-operated transmitters operate continuously for at least 48 hours over a wide range of temperatures. The International COSPA SARSAT system has ceased satellite processing of 121.5 and 243.0 MHz beacons. All beacon owners and users are urged to replace their 121.5 and 243.0 MHz beacons with 406.0 MHz beacons as soon as possible. A false ELT signal can lead to expensive and frustrating searches, interfere with genuine emergency transmissions, and hinder or prevent the timely location of crash sites. Many unintentional activations have occurred because of aerobatics, hard landings, movement by ground crews, and aircraft maintenance. You can minimize ELT false alarms by monitoring 121.5 MHz during flight, prior to engine shutdown, and after maintenance. You can assist in identifying ELT transmissions by monitoring the ELT frequency when you fly. If you hear an ELT, report your position to the nearest ATC facility the first and last times you hear the signal, as well as your position and cruising altitude at the ELT's maximum signal strength. ELTs must be tested and maintained according to the manufacturer's instructions. The FARs require that the ELT battery be replaced or recharged if the battery is rechargeable after one half of the battery's useful life or when the transmitter has been in use for more than one cumulative hour. You should test your ELT in a room that blocks the broadcast of signals, but if you can't, you can conduct ELT testing in your aircraft on the ground only during the first five minutes after the hour and for no longer than three audible sweeps. Do not test your ELT while airborne.
When you use the radio, it's important to speak in a professional manner that ensures that others understand the message you're trying to convey. In this lesson, you learn these radio communication procedures and protocols by exploring eight topics. VHF communication equipment. Using the radio. Communicating letters and numbers. Communicating time. Common traffic advisory frequency. Communicating at controlled airports. Lost communication procedures. And emergency communication procedures.